Mike Martin. Um, I'm involved in men's ministry here at church. And this is uh, Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. <clears throat> John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom, and patient and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see a voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, and he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Therefore... Write, therefore, the things you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Thanks, Mike. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. The idea is that if we had an image, if we were trying to describe all that is in that picture, well, it's going to take at least a thousand words to say all that's happening there. So if we had a snapshot of you, a picture of you from some point in your life, well, it would, it would be able to tell us a lot about who you are. Thousands, a thousand words worth. We'd be able to guess at what is your age in that picture? What, what's your gender? If you're doing an activity, uh, what, what are you gifted in? What are your skills? What are your hobbies, your, your, your abilities? We, we could make a stab at that. If you're with people, we can, we can guess who some of the important people in your life are. Maybe it's friends or family. Based off of the expression on your face, we could tell a lot about your personality or the emotion that you're feeling at the time. A picture is worth a thousand words. Now, the difficulty is, is you are worth more than a thousand words. The, to describe all that you are, to, to say all that you've gone through, all that you've experienced, all of your gifts and abilities, the events and accomplishments, that takes way more than a thousand words to explain. That if we look at just this one picture, it, it doesn't say the whole story of you. That it might show us one important relationship or maybe a couple, but it doesn't show us everyone who's significant in your life. It may show one activity that you're doing, but uh, there, you probably have more hobbies, several activities that you excel at, other gifts beyond just what's in the picture. It, you, we might be able to tell the emotion that you're experiencing in there, but, but you, well, I, I guess I shouldn't generalize. Most of us have more than one emotion that we're capable of, and so uh, it's not going to capture all of who you are. One picture doesn't give the full understanding of who you are as a person. And it made me think this, this past week, what is the picture that you have of Jesus? What is the image that comes to your mind when you think about Jesus? Maybe it's, it's a, a picture that, that is of an event that takes place during the gospel. Like we picture Jesus on the cross. We picture Jesus teaching, maybe from the Sermon on the Mount. Or, or maybe it's not necessarily from a, a part of the gospel, not necessarily something that we see in the Bible, but it's, it's a picture of Jesus based off of how we relate to him. It's his love or his grace or his kindness or his mercy. After all, Jesus is one of the most popular and common subjects in art throughout church history. 
There's so many represent, uh, representations of him of trying to capture who is this Jesus. Maybe, maybe it's a picture of him like that. Maybe it's a picture of him like the one that was on the wall of the, the house I was staying at with this family I lived with for a while. It was this uh, white guy holding a lamb surrounded by a bunch of creepy looking kids. So there's a lot of pictures that we can have of Jesus. But the same principle is true. While a thousand words, one picture, cannot fully summarize or represent who you are, so often the picture that we have of, Je- of Jesus is limited, that it takes more than a thousand words to describe him, that, that the image that we might have of him is, is just so small and compared to who he is. At, at least for me, when, when I try to picture what Jesus looks like, I have such a hard time representing how complex and pure and perfect and lovely and wonderful and divine Jesus is. And the difficulty for me is when I have a a too small picture of Jesus, it shows that I have too small of an understanding of Jesus. Having too small of an understanding of Jesus, this means that the life that I live in response to him is too small as well. This is where I love the book of Revelation. Right from the beginning, we're told what this entire book is. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a picture of who Jesus is from Jesus himself. And the description that we have, this image that we have all throughout this book, it shows something greater than what we can fabricate in our heads, that we can paint on a canvas, that we can imagine of him because he's far greater than the pictures we come up with. We talked uh, last week as we started the series that the book of Revelation is full of images and symbols, uh, this idea that, that it pulls back the curtain, that it's so easy for us to be focused on what's going on in this life, to be consumed by what we can touch and feel and see on this planet, that it's so easy for us to fill our time with these things, and yet Revelation pulls back the curtains on that and says this is what's actually going on. This is the God who's working now, who's working towards a future. This is what God is doing now in the midst of all that we see. And it it should come as no surprise then that if it's the revelation of Jesus, if it's pulling back the curtain to show us what God is doing now, that the book starts off with an incredibly detailed picture of Jesus and one that takes way more than a thousand words to understand and describe and one that's way uh, much more superior to what we can conjure up on our own. Because the the picture of Jesus that's given to us in Revelation chapter one, was this picture of Jesus as king, priest, and judge who confronts, comforts, and calls. As we read through Revelation uh, chapter one, it shows us Jesus, this picture of Jesus as king, priest, and judge who confronts, comforts, and calls. Now, uh, Mike just read a a section from us from verses 9 through 20. There's a lot of descriptions, a lot of images, a lot of symbols that are used about Jesus in here. And we might be trying to wonder, how how do we wrestle with this? How do we understand what is going on in in these symbols? First and foremost, we're not supposed to try to think of how do we draw Jesus then? We're told this is, this is all these things about him. So how can we draw him? What, what, are, what is it supposed to all look like? The, the images that are used are not necessarily there so that we can try to, try to get a, a painting of Jesus and say, okay, now I got it. I mean, that sure hasn't stopped people throughout history of painting what they see in Revelation chapter one. Uh, here's one from 11th century Germany uh, that, I mean, sword in the mouth, stars in the hand. There's some lampstands. John is looking, so it's doing an okay job. Uh, Justin said that it looks like Jesus is, is bringing his lunchbox with him, which I don't know how much I see that. Maybe Justin's just hungry, in which I remind him we have donuts all around. Uh, but, but it does an okay job. But does this capture the magnitude, the magnitude of what we read? Does it show Jesus as glorious as he is? I'm not sure it does. But other people have tried painting this. One that I found online that I love for probably all the wrong reasons. Uh, It's an anime representation of what's going on here. And uh, I mean, yeah, that sword is definitely in the mouth. Uh, uh, And there's, there's stars in hand. There's light coming off of it. There's fire in the eyes. Lampstands. But is this really capturing what is represented about Jesus? Is this really what the picture is trying to entail? 
Because like Revelation, it's not telling us to, to, of what these symbols are so that we can try to, try to figure out what does Jesus look like and, and then say, yes, I got it. I understand it. Now we can move on. No, it's trying to paint a picture of Jesus that's bigger than what we can imagine. Rather than showing us exactly what did Jesus look like at the time, it is showing us who is this Jesus? What is he like? And the only way that we can get to an understanding about that, the only way that we can understand these symbols is by going back to the Old Testament. The first picture that we have of Jesus is Jesus as king. We're presented this idea, not so much so that we can draw it, but so that we can understand that Jesus is king. I mean, it's stated very clearly in, in verse five. It says, Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. That Jesus is the king of kings. There is no one, even those who have authority now, no one who is the ruler of him. Jesus is the ruler of all kings. It said a little bit more implicitly in verse nine. John is saying, uh, John on the isle, uh, island of Patmos, who's here on account of uh, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Did I get it all right off the top of my head? Close enough. Uh, the, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And yet what tradition tells us is that John is exiled to the island of Patmos, this small island uh, in the Aegean Sea, this, this Greek island. And he's there because he wasn't giving uh, allegiance to Caesar. He was sent to this prison island to mine because he wasn't being a good citizen at the time. And yet what he's saying, I'm here because of the faithfulness to Jesus, faithfulness to God. That you, Caesar, you might claim that you're a king. You, Caesar, might claim that you are a god but I'm here because the one who rules the kings of the earth. I am here because there's an actual king, Jesus. But the, uh, the images go on even further. John looks, if, if we were to, to summarize, like what is, what is the most common thing that happens in the book of Revelation? It is that John looks. It's this uh, turning point that often happens. It's something is going on, but then John looks. Well, here John looks and sees one like the Son of Man. Now, it, there doesn't necessarily have to be anything special about that. I mean, we, when we ask ourselves, what do the children of humans tend to look like? It's not a trick question, unless if things have medically gone really wrong. Like, it, children of humans tend to look like humans, right? And so the Son of Man look, should look like a man. So it could just be saying, I looked and I saw someone who looked like a human. But if we know our Old Testament... Or if we know the fact that the, the most common phrase that Jesus had to refer to himself was the son of man, that it might make us think back to Daniel chapter seven. So if you wanna turn to Daniel and uh, maybe stick something in the book of Daniel, we'll be here a few times throughout. If there's only something around you, something that we might've distributed, something to, to mark a place in your book, Ah, uh, anyways, if only we had one of those things that could be really beneficial to keeping Daniel uh, saved as we will turn back to it a couple times. So in, in the book of Daniel, we see this prophet named Daniel who like John in the book of Revelation has a vision. God gives him this vision to, help, to tell him about something that will take place. And in Daniel chapter seven, we see the significance of John seeing one like the Son of Man. This is verse 13. It says, I, so Daniel, saw in the night visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, this name for God. So this Son of Man comes to God and is presented before him, affirmed by God on a mission from God. And what does he do? Verse 14, to him was given dominion, rulership, authority. The son of man is given glory and a kingdom. Maybe you've already put this together, but most of the people who have a kingdom, well, they tend to be kings. So he's made this king that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. This one approved from God, who's, who's on a mission from God, is given this kingdom, is made a king over all people, nations, and languages. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass, pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. So what John is saying when he says, I looked and I saw one like a son of man, he's saying, that king, well, here he is. 
that king who's, who's come to, to represent God's rule, to bring justice and goodness and righteousness to not just a small part of the world, but to all nations, all people at all times. That king is now here. I turned and saw a king. I turned and saw Jesus. But it goes further than that. It's not just saying that Jesus is here as some representative of God. He goes on to say that Jesus is God himself. Because we're given this description that he looks and he sees Jesus, this king with white hair, hair like wool, like snow. Now, at the culture at the time, it was one that had a lot of reverence for their elders. And so having white hair wasn't something that you would uh, try to cover with, with medical uh, uh, things that you would find. But white hair was the sign of dignity and knowledge and wisdom. And so it's saying that Jesus had that, but it goes further because it's already mentioning son of man. So we're thinking Daniel chapter seven, but now we're hearing that his hair was like wool and, and there should be some alarms going off or there would have been for people at the time, some alarms going off. We're already thinking about Daniel seven. Where might you find this in Daniel seven? Well, hopefully you use that bookmark because we're gonna look at Daniel seven, chapter nine. Or chapter seven, verse nine, sorry. I'll try to catch you before you start turning. Daniel seven, chapter seven, verse nine. It says, and as I looked, thrones were placed. In the ancient of days, God took his seat. God on his throne. God is the one who created all things, made all things, sustains all things, is the rightful ruler of all things. God is on his throne. And his clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. So what's happening in Revelation 1? I looked and saw one like a son of man. I looked and saw that king that Daniel was looking for, but he's not just some representative. Yes, he's here with eternal rule over all people, but he is God himself, his hair white like wool. Here he is in his rightful place on his throne, king and ruler over all things, have an everlasting dominion. No one will ever take this away. He is the king of kings. You, Caesar, can send me to an island all you want, but here is the king. Here is God. Here is Jesus. One other image to draw our attention to, it says that Jesus has star, the seven stars in his right hand. The right hand is a position of power and authority. We're told in verse 20 that the stars are the angels. So what is it saying? It's that this Jesus has come. He's the long-awaited king, ruling over all, bringing justice and righteousness and God's mercy and goodness to the world as God himself. But not just ruling over his people, but all people. Not just ruling over part of the earth, but all earth. But not just ruling over earth as well, but even heaven is subject to him. Essentially, in just these details that's given to us in this one chapter, there is nothing outside of his control nothing outside of his authority. This is Jesus, the King. Is that the picture of him that we have? When we think about who is Jesus, is the idea that Jesus is King, is that the thing that comes to our mind? That in the, the midst of this world that we live in, do we have the understanding that he is the one that rules it? As we go through us, uh, throughout the chaos and, and the confusion of life, do we turn first to the king who's in control of all of life, all that we might face? When we make decisions, do we do so understanding that there's a God who rules over all things? When we set our priorities or our focus or how we're gonna use our time or our resources, do we do so with the understanding that there is a king who is, all things are subject to, including our priorities, our time, our resources, our focus. The picture that we're given here is Jesus as the king. The second picture that we have is Jesus as the priest. Jesus is priest. I mean, first and foremost, the, the, the uh, picture of this that's given to us quite clearly, we're told that Jesus is wearing this long robe with a sash around his chest. And well, that's, that's the clothing that priests would have wear. So Jesus is dressed for the part at least. But then we're told this really fascinating detail that Jesus is standing in the middle of these seven lampstands. 
All right, we got a lot of background work to do for this one. So lampstands were, were this picture or, or this, this furniture that was used, this important part of the temple for the Israelites in the, in the Old Testament. So when you talked about lampstands like this, well, it really only would ever mean one thing. It's the thing that's in the temple, the thing that's inside God's presence. But then when you, the temple is destroyed and there's this uh, plan to rebuild it, there's another prophet that comes along, another prophet that God gives visions to, like Daniel did, like John would have. And this is the prophet Zechariah. And in chapter four, you don't have to turn there, but uh, maybe write down Zechariah four to, to check my work to see, am I describing what's actually there? Hold me accountable to this. Uh, in in Zechariah chapter four, the, uh, the prophet Zechariah has this image, this vision And it's of this one lampstand with seven bowls. Already we've seen the connection there? Seven and a lampstand. This one lampstand with with seven bowls. And and, and as he's doing it, it's it's showing that this this rebuilding of the temple, showing that God's presence is coming, but a promise that goes beyond that. A promise that his presence isn't just going to be in one building, uh, confined to one place, that his presence is going to go to his people. There's this incredible promise. I love this, this verse in Zechariah 4. It says that my people will not live by power or might, but by the Spirit of the Lord. How often do we try to live by power and might and yet the promise is there that my people will live by the spirit of the Lord. This promise that's given, there's this lampstand, this image, lampstand with seven lamps on top. And now John looks and he sees Jesus standing in the midst of these lampstands. I mean, only the priest was supposed to do that, right? The lamps were inside the temple, inside the presence of God. No one was allowed to stand amongst the lampstand except for the priest. And there's Jesus doing exactly that. But then verse 20 tells us that these these lampstands are representing these churches. And so here is Jesus standing in the midst of his churches, his people as God, not just representing the temple, but bringing God's presence to his people, that God is with them in their midst despite all that they're going through. The promise, the the incredible vision that Zechariah had, the the spirit of the Lord on the people themselves, well, here is Jesus standing with his people as God, as the their priest, not just the means for them to find salvation, but the very access to God itself comes through Jesus as his priest. And is that the picture of Jesus that we have? Do we picture him in this way? I, I mean, sure, most of us uh, understand, or one of the first things that will come to mind is, yeah, Jesus is the sacrifice by which I'm saved, but do we picture him as the priest who's continuing to atone for us? That we still go astray? and yet he still makes covering for our sins. That he is the priest always in our midst, that that we're never too far away from him. We've never gone away from our presence. Here is the priest giving us access to God. Do we picture him as the one who enables us not to live by power or might, but by the spirit that he has sent? That he is the one who's always atoning on our behalf. Do we picture Jesus as our priest? The third picture that we have in Revelation chapter one is Jesus as judge. Jesus is judge in these verses. Now, I never told you to remove that bookmark from Daniel, so hopefully you kept it uh, because we are going to Daniel chapter 10 for this one. Daniel 10. And even if you don't want to turn there or or can't turn there or uh, I'm throwing too many passages to you, uh, here's simply what I'm asking you to do. Listen. Listen and see if you notice anything similar between what Daniel sees in Daniel chapter 10 and what was read for us earlier in Revelation 1. See if there's any similar language, if there's uh, anything that we pick up that's shared between them. Daniel chapter 10, starting in verse 5. It says, Daniel, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. And his body was like beryl, this, this precious gemstone. His face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and his legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. There's quite a few things that we see shared between those two passages. 
Uh, first and foremost, uh, this idea that Jesus has eyes like flaming fire in Revelation 1, this picture here, eyes like flaming torches. Uh, fire is, is a very common image used throughout the Old Testament. Uh, we often think about it as, oh, it's a, that symbol of punishment and damnation, but more often than not, it's this picture of refinement. That fire is a thing that, that takes away any impurities, imperfection. And here is Jesus with eyes like flaming fire, bringing judgment, but bringing purification as well. The idea is that just by one glance, he has this penetrating understanding. Just by looking, he's able to bring purity and purification for where we've gone astray, to bring judgment with the means of restoration as well, just by looking. It also says that his feet are like burnished bronze. It's a similar picture in Daniel 10, but arms and feet there as well. In the Old Testament, the feet is, is kind of the symbol of the direction that one's whole life is going. So in the Old Testament, there's uh, praying that God's word would be a lamp unto our feet, that it would guide us in following after him rather than our feet being pointed away from him and going astray. And Jesus has feet like burnished bronze. It's perfect. It will not be moved. It will never go astray. The judgment here is, is uh, more seen in Daniel chapter 10 as, as the arms and legs are of this burnished bronze. When we compare it to chapter two, we get this image of these nations that look like they're secure and built on good foundations and yet they crumble and blow away like the wind. But here's this vision of one who will not have that be done. The contrast between them is showing that they're here in this one, there's purity. The judgment is clear between this one lasting and those nations crumbling instead. Then we get to the voice that's mentioned. In Revelation 1, it's uh, Jesus' voice is given like a trumpet or the sound of rushing water. In Daniel 10, it's uh, the sound of a great multitude. Uh, in, in case we're not picking up what the imagery is telling us, it is a loud voice like tremendously loud, one that will not be drowned out by any one or any other sound or any person or any other thing will pale in comparison to the sound of his voice. Nothing can compete with it. It overwhelms, it takes over all. You cannot miss it. But the content of the voice is given as well. Revelation 1 uh, verse I don't have it here. Uh, 16, yes. And so it, it is, is coming out of his mouth is this two-edged sword. Imagery comes from Isaiah, but it's saying that this voice that's so loud, what it's saying is this sword, this word of God speaking truth, cutting away at all that runs contrary to what is true from God. It's this voice that's overwhelming and bringing judgment. All who have gone astray, there's correction that's given to them. Just as this, uh, it talks about how he's so radiant, this light that comes out of him drives away all darkness. This sword of truth, this voice that none can escape from brings the judgment of God. Is that the picture of Jesus that we have? This perfect king, this holy priest do we picture the, the, him coming as a judge for the world? Do we live in light of the fact that his radiant light drives away all darkness? Do we make the choices and investments that we have in this life now with the realization that there will be a day with a voice that we cannot avoid that we will see Jesus as judge? As we look at these images that are found all throughout Revelation chapter one, it, it's, it's awakening us to a bigger picture of Jesus. And there's some implications that come for our life because this is who Jesus is, because this is who we see him to be. And the first thing that we see is that as Jesus is this king and priest and judge, that the implication for us is that he confronts us. Jesus is king, priest, and judge who confronts us that he's not just standing there in a robe with radiant light because it, it just feels cool. That he's not coming with, with this booming voice, a sword from his mouth, you know, for, for those other people. But he is the judge of the whole world. Second Corinthians 5 tells us that we must all stand before, uh, appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every person 
will see Jesus as judge. That all of us have gone astray. We've turned towards other things. We, we get so focused on this world that we need these images to pull back the curtains. We've all gone astray, and so we will all see Jesus as this judge. We'll be confronted by him as the one who brings righteousness and purity to the world. But he also confronts us with a greater understanding of himself. I mean, this is what we've been talking about, that, that so often our images, our pictures of Jesus are far too small. If I could be kind of, kind of crude, the images that we have of Jesus are often far too cuddly. That we might picture him as, as Jesus on the cross, which is right and true and good, but we don't picture him as Jesus on the throne. That we might see Jesus teaching on the mount, but we don't see him as the priest who continues to atone for when we ignore his teaching. We see him as a white guy holding a lamb, surrounded by creepy looking kids, but we don't picture him as Jesus who's the judge of the whole world that our pictures of him are often far too small. And so what we have instead is a picture of who Jesus is, who he really is. I mean, even if we don't understand these symbols, even if we didn't do the work that we did to go back to Zechariah 4, Daniel 7, or Daniel 10, or all the other verses that I saved us from turning back to, but they're all inspiring uh, Revelation chapter 1, even if we don't do the work to go to the Old Testament, the point of the symbols is still there. That as we see this Jesus, as he's so much bigger and pure and holy and awesome in every sense of the word, that, that these are things that awaken us. As we're confronted by the actual Jesus, then we ought to have one response and one response only. And it's the response that we see John do, falling on the ground as if he's dead. Because this Jesus, the real Jesus, the, the image, the, the picture that we're given, he's so much bigger than we can imagine. He's, he's, he's incomprehensible at times, so different, so magnificent. The reaction is just falling down. And yet this is the image of Jesus that we need. Because so often the ones that we can come up with, the ones that we can grasp and understand and, and uh, that it's limited to just this snapshot of Jesus, those ones don't actually do what we need them to do. Because as we're confronted by the real Jesus, this is how true life change happens. Because before 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we're given hope and encouragement in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, which tells us how we're able to stand on that day. It says that we all, with unveiled face, nothing between us and God, nothing making it blurry or, or being a shield for us, with nothing between us, beholding the glory of the Lord, when we see this actual picture of this actual Jesus, what happens? We're transformed into that same image, that same picture from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is spirit. So what does this mean? It means that when we have this fuller picture, when we're confronted with the Jesus, not, not the one that we're comfortable with, not the small images that we might have, but the Jesus, well, that's how we become more like him. That's how we have footing to stand on that day of judgment. That when, when, when we're confronted by the actual Jesus, we see the goodness and glory that's due to him and the life so we can live in response to which gets to the second point here, that Jesus as king, priest, and judge comforts us. He comforts us. After John falls to the ground because this picture that he has of Jesus is so much bigger than he knew. And this is John who traveled with Jesus, who knew him, who spent three years with him. As he sees this greater picture of Jesus than he's ever had before, he falls down as one who knows Jesus. But as he does so, Jesus comes up to him. You, you know, the one that all these descriptions are true of with the radiant glory and sword out of a mouth. That Jesus goes up to John and puts a hand on him. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Have you looked in a mirror lately, Jesus? Of course I'm going to be afraid. You're the king that I rebel against. You're the priest who atones for me, but I still run away and defile myself. You are the judge who's coming to judge the world to judge me. And yet Jesus says, don't be afraid. 
that for John and those in John's position, those who trust in this Jesus for life and future and encouragement, those who trust in him, well, this wrath that is not coming for you, those keys to death and Haiti, well, they won't be used for you. That those who trust in him are given all of this comfort. A picture of a hand. Encouragement to don't, not be afraid. Not because of anything that we've done, but because this is who we have as our Jesus. King, priest, and judge. Last bit is, as Jesus is king, priest, and judge, he calls us. He calls us. We talked about how Revelation is pulling back the curtains on this world and showing us what God is doing and what God will do. But because this is the Jesus that we have, we are joined to the work that God is doing. He calls us to be part of that work. Uh, I, I love how this book starts up. Verses uh, four through seven are really a summary of, of all that we'll see in the book of Revelation. If, if we weren't so limited in our understanding of Jesus, this is all that we would need as a series, but we'll be in it for a while instead. Uh, but Revelation one, four through seven is such a great picture of who Jesus is and how we've been called into the work that he is doing because of that. It says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, Asia, grace and peace, uh, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings on the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Because that's who our, our, our Jesus is. That's the picture of him that we have. What does he call us to? Verse six. And he made us a kingdom. Priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. See, here we have this picture of this Jesus who loves us and he frees us from our sins. A picture of Jesus as the reason why we can have grace and peace in this world. Uh, and a picture of Jesus who's the one who joins us to be part of the work that God is doing. It says, first and foremost, that Jesus is the king who makes us a kingdom. That, that we are joined to him by his rule and made his people able to know and be known by him. What this means for us is wherever you go on this earth, you are representing a kingdom, an ambassador of what Jesus has done and what he will do soon. That wherever you go, you are an embassy to the work that Jesus is doing and will do. You are representing him as king to the world. When you're talking with your neighbors, as you're meeting people for the first time, you are doing so sitting under the kingdom of Jesus, representing him to the world. Jesus is the priest who makes us priests. That through him we have atonement and sacrifice and covering from our sins. We have been freed from our sins by his blood. And wherever you go, you do so as a priest. Healing and restoration in this world. That as you talk with people, as you meet people in a grocery store or at school or wherever you might be, as you are someone who trusts in Jesus as your priest, you are there representing him as a priest, showing the world where grace and peace may be found. And we're told that all the nations, every nation will wail on account of him, that Jesus is the judge who will bring judgment and justice and righteousness and God's goodness to all places that there will be a restoration of all things in the end. But until that day, we help people to see that you don't have to wait till then. You can trust in him now. You can follow him now. You can find the joy that is in Jesus here. This is the picture of Jesus that we have. And it's better than anything that we can conjure on our own because it's only this Jesus that can go to John who's exiled in prison, doing forced labor on an island, away from people he loves, ripped away from any source of freedom. Only this Jesus can say to him, don't be afraid. Only this Jesus can speak to these seven churches who are going through tremendous suffering, or, or maybe, maybe they're not. They're just looking at how great this Roman Empire looks like. You know, there's, there's security here. There's peace. There's, there's real opportunities. I, I can invest my time into this instead. Only this Jesus 
can speak into that situation and say there's something better coming. And only this Jesus can speak to us, that that is us in this church right here, and say that there's a reason for encouragement and hope and life and future. We trust in this Jesus because we trust his words and we trust in him. Uh, This chapter starts by looking at what has been accomplished already. We can look to life now. We can look to life in the future with, with trust in this Jesus that he will do what he says he does because of what he's already accomplished. It talks about how we are freed from sins because of his blood. Because he's done that, we can trust him going forward. That he is the one who died but is alive forevermore. And because of that, we can trust him going forward. That is the picture of Jesus that we have.